Well, first of all, thank you very much for the very kind invitation uh, to participate in this workshop. Um, I'm greatly honored. Um, as a student 20 plus years ago, I would actually roam around in these rooms uh, studying here, use the paleography room and the Ambrosiana collection. So it brings back a lot of memories. And I'm honored to be here and uh, sharing uh, some uh, thoughts uh, with this uh, esteemed gathering. Um, I would also like to highlight that this presentation is, I dedicate this in the memory of Father Dimitrios Dzerpos, who was a mentor to uh, Dr. Simic uh, in Athens and was also my mentor uh, for a few years when I lived in Athens for about uh, eight, nine years until his untimely death. He was uh, obviously a, a priest, but also a liturgist who taught at the University of Athens. Um, and I'd like to thank Costa for Dr. Simic for his wonderful contribution because uh, his, um, uh, his work, his book, has, is a contribution not only to uh, the field of hymnography and hymnology, but also has direct and indirect implications to the field of liturgical studies. And I would like to highlight what I think is one of those indirect or direct, it's, uh, it's up to us to decide in the end, um, um, impact on the field of liturgical studies. The late Father Robert Taft uh, is the person that I would say has defined modern Byzantine liturgical studies. And in his small but extremely significant book, The Byzantine Rite, A Short History, he basically establishes a grid uh, upon which um, we are all called to study the history of Byzantine liturgy. He identified five phases in the evolution and the history of Byzantine liturgy. And as you will see, some overlap. Uh, also highlighting the complexity of kind of like figuring out this history. So you have the Paleo-Byzantine phase up to the 5th century, the Imperial phase from Justinian up to 1261, the Dark Ages, the so-called, I would say today, Dark Ages, uh, 610 to roughly 850 or so, uh, what then he called the Studite era, the Studite synthesis, from roughly toward, towards the end of, uh, of iconoclasm and the uh, coming of St. Theodore of Studi to the Studios Monastery uh, uh, in, if I recall the date, 798. And then, of course, the neo sabbatic synthesis from the fall of um, Constantinople to the Fourth Crusade till today. Um, so basically, over the years, uh, as uh, I've been engaged with uh, the teaching of Byzantine liturgy, I kind of translated that uh, division of Byzantine liturgical history that Father Taft has done into this table. So you can see kind of like the cathedral rite of Constantinople on the one hand, and now this is how Father Taft expressed it, right? Jerusalem and its monastic use on the other side and through the Studite synthesis, you have the two kind of like coming together and engaging with one another. And this kind of like mutual coming together gave rise to what we call the Studite synthesis, which lasts from the end of roughly kind of like, as we said, 800 to the year 1204. And then we have uh, from 1204 to 12, 1545, the neo sabbatic synthesis, and that's codified or set in stone, if you will, with the first edition, printed edition of the neo sabbatic Typikon. And what we have today, whether you want to call it the Greek tradition or the Slavic tradition, is various expressions or adaptations of that neo sabbatic uh, Typikon to the current, uh, if the modern needs. Robert Taft is indeed a giant, and it's upon his shoulders that uh, we continue uh, research in liturgical studies. And in the last 15 or so years, there are a number of studies that have come out that have 
made us or forced us to look back into this model that Father Taft put put forth, extremely helpful, but forces us to nuance that model. Uh, and I think Costa Simic's book and work actually is one of those uh, elements that come to help us nuance uh, what we see here. Um, so allow me, before going into the particular contribution of Costa Simic's book, allow me to, to, to explain how things have kind of like shifted um, uh, uh, the last 15 or so years. Notice under Jerusalem, in the, in the Taft schema, we talk about the monastic use that comes to Constantinople. Modern liturgical research, and I would direct you to the work of Stefano Parenti and Stig Simeon Freushoff, have highlighted that what comes to Constantinople is not the monastic tradition but it's basically the tradition of the Cathedral of Jerusalem with monastic influences from Saba's monastery. The Orologion, for example, on the Psalter, Stig Simeon Freushoff argues, are not a monastic Orologion, Book of Hours, and a monastic Psalter, but they're basically the Book of Hours and the Psalter of a different cathedral tradition, the cathedral tradition of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So what comes to Jerusalem, to, to Constantinople, is not something purely monastic. We need to nuance what comes to Constantinople, uh, you know, at the end of iconoclasm. And also, um, this is called the Agiopolitis, the Hagiopolitan tradition, and you see that term used more and more in recent publications. And then you see more and more when referring to the cathedral office, you see the term Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, or the Ecclesiastes tradition as identifying the tradition, the cathedral tradition of Constantinople. And the argument is that these are the terms that the documents, the historical sources use, and hence these are the, the, the terms we should get used to using today. Another thing that needs to be nuanced is that and this is particularly, again, through the, the work of Stefano Parenti, but also Stig Simeon Freushoff, and particularly his latest article in Dumbarton Oaks Papers, is that there is considerable evidence of composition in the hymnograph Jerusalem hymnographical genre of the canon, even before iconoclasm. And that the place of that Constantinopolitan composition of a... Uh, Jerusalem hymnographical genre takes place most likely in the palace, by palace hymnographers, and therefore the place where these would be used were possibly chapels of the palace. Um, and of course, that kind of like pushes the date of when the two traditions come together a little bit earlier. I would say maybe even considerably earlier. It's not like, you know, the very beginning of the ninth century. It's not the year roughly 800, but it's 650 to 700 or so, seven, uh, so before iconoclasm. So we're pushing kind of like the date of the beginning of what we call Sudite synthesis earlier. Another thing that I think needs to be further studied is uh, the office of the Akimiti monks. Uh, Constantinople had its own uh, native monastic tradition, that of the sleepless monks, the so-called Akim, hence Akimiti monks, or vice versa, Akimiti, hence sleepless, um, who had their own tradition. Uh, that tradition is survived, survives only in three manuscripts, one in Athens, one in uh, Monili Monos in, uh, in Mytilini, and uh, the third one I forget right now. But these three were studied by Fudulis in the 60s. That was his dissertation. And it's time to revisit uh, that tradition. And it looks like, actually, at least in, in as this, this, uh, these, this tradition has survived in the manuscripts, you, we already also see Jerusalem influence in the office of the Akimiti, the sleepless monks. So that's something a dissertation student 
to take take up and do, write an excellent dissertation that will kind of like clarify and define the native Constantinopolitan monastic tradition, the potential of the relation between that native Constantinopolitan tradition with Jerusalem. And of course, all this discussion then allows us or forces us, you can use whatever word you want, to redefine, look at, again at what we call the Studite synthesis. Um, some people might even challenge the term Studite synthesis. I don't, I personally would not go that far, but I think we need to define what's going on and actually expand kind of like the, the, the two bookshelves of the discussion of the Studite synthesis further back as Stig Simon Freushoff and Parenti have done, but also a forward. And the forward because every shift in liturgical history does not take place automatically. It's not like a, sh a, a switch, that you flick a switch and suddenly from cathedral, everything becomes studite, whatever that might mean. So what, I, what I'm proposing, and this is where I think uh, Costa's uh, work becomes extremely significant, is that it allows us to kind of like use methodological principles to try to establish how does this shift takes place, take place. Under what stages are followed. And one thing that actually I think is very useful in the study is the role and the place and the popularity of the canon, this hymnographical genre of the canon. So the received narrative is that the monastics uh, in, uh, during I call the iconoclastic era were by and large uh, with the iconophiles, um, whereas the cathedral clergy were aligned with imperial policy. In other words, they were in favor, more or less, with iconoclasm. So the iconophiles won, which led to the monasticization of the Byzantine church, which basically led to the de facto dominance of the liturgical practice of the monks. And we see that most visibly in the Liturgy of the Hours. Now, um, I have a couple of handouts here. It's one, one each. You have two handouts. Handout number one, it's like with a very small number one on the top left of the page is um, a, um, the um, the tipicon of the so-called tipicon of the great church from the Mateus edition. And handout number two is the synaxarion of the Th monastery of the Theotokos Evergetis, uh, and both are on uh, from the date of September fourteenth. When we compare the two documents, and we will use September 14th kind of like as our uh, example, uh, we will see that there are com two completely different structures. And in the Studite office, there is much space dedicated to non-biblical hymnography. So I'll guide you back to the slides again, and then we will go back to the handouts. So if we look at the hymnographical genres that we find uh, in these two documents, and this list is selective, we find in the cathedral or the sang office or ecclesiastes, the responses to antiphons of Psalter. And there we know that the responses to the antiphon of the Psalter was either Alleluia or a three word phrase Lord, save me, Lord, heal me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, whatever, but very short. Um, two places that you see um, hymnography kind of like developing, but very, very kind of like um, uh, slowly, if you will, is the so-called kekragari, which is basically the response to Psalm 140, uh, 
sorry, that's 140, not 150, in Vespers. And the Pentecostari, which as you can guess, is the response to Psalm 50 in Matins. And then you also have a troparion, which usually kind of like uh, the, the, the hymn, a short hymn that summarizes the meaning, the themes of the feast of the day. You look then at the Studite office and you see a, 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 an explosion, if you will, of hymnographical genres, uh, stichiron, idiomelon, apolitikion, troparion, kathisma, prosomion, theotokion, I apologize, it's I-O, not O-I, the canon, which is kind of like the centerpiece of our discussion today, and the exapostilarion. So if we look at the structures, and here kind of like I'm using the cathedral vespers uh, as uh, we see it in the, the so-called Tipicon of the Great Church, uh, together with uh, the Barberini Codex, and also then Studite Vespers as seen in the Evergetis Tipicon, we kind of like see that they have fundamentally very different structures. Uh, you can also see those when, if you compare your handouts. Um, just to highlight a couple of things, the opening psalm in the uh, cathedral office is Psalm 85. Uh, the opening psalm in the Studite Vespers is Psalm uh, 103. Both have Psalm 140 as you know, the central vesperal psalm, which is a classic vesperal psalm in the Christian tradition, but it functions in very different ways. Um, notice also in the uh, cathedral vespers, the structure of the small antiphons, which is a, uh, which is a very characteristically cathedral uh, liturgical unit, um, uh, which is absent most often from the Studite context. And then you also have this very interesting uh, third part, which is a series of prayers and dismissals. So you have the Catechumens, two prayers of the faithful, the Angel of Peace Litany, third prayer of the faithful, and prayer of the bow bowing of the heads. Studite Vespers is very different. Um, Psalm 103, as I said, Psalm 140, 141, 129, 116, you have the entrance, you have the Fossilaron, um, it's not in this, but it's there, um, and then you also have space for more hymnography. So when we compare the two, uh, what are common elements? Not much. Uh, what's interesting is, is that the cathedral prayers of the... Uh, antiphons uh, do not disappear, but they're grouped together and uh, recited silently by the priest when Psalm 103 is read or uh, in, uh, is said in the Studite Vespers. The readings of the important um, uh, of the important feasts are common. You have an entrance. You have the Ecteni Litany. The prayer of the Kephaloclesi of the bowing of the heads is also from the cathedral office. And the Apolitikion, which is common to the troparion of the feast. So this here is usually common with this here. A different term, but it's usually the same hymn. Now, here in red, you see kind of like the hymnic slots non-biblical hymnic slots. There are only two cases in the cathedral office. The response is Psalm 140 and the troparion, which basically is the hymn of the day. In the Studite Vespers, you see a tremendous rise in the number and the amount of hymnody. You have at Psalm 140 and the other Psalms intercalated stichira, uh, six, eight, or 10 of those together with a doxastikon, a hymn that opens with glory to the Father, now and ever, the Gloria Patri. And then you have Stichira at the Stichos, closely to the end, then you have the Apolitikion. So you kind of like see an explosion of hymnography. Similarly with Matins, again, you have here the structures of cathedral uh, orthros, uh, I apologize for this, this is Matins, this is not Vespers. Um, so you basically have here the, uh, the structure of the two offices, cathedral and studite uh, in Matins. And you see it's a very different structure. There are certain elements that are shared, and these are in green. You can see it's not much. Um, so we're talking about two drastically different structures. 
And then when, when we compare hymnology, again, you basically have the eighth antiphon with responses and Psalm 50 with the responses. Um, whereas in Orthros, you have the Triadica, you have the Kathisma, the Ipakoi, the Canon, the Exapostillarion, the Eni, the Apolitikion. And the Canon is basically aligned there. But if you think of the canon as a genre, it's a whole series, a system of hymns, as um, you know, uh, Dr. Simitz explains in his book, that take, take basically a large chunk of orthros. One could even say that is the, it's the hymnographical center of, of, of orthros. So uh, if you want to kind of like take a case study, and kind of like compare the two and how the two uh, look, I, I've provided you with two handouts. Number one is the cathedral office. Number two is the studite office as expressed at the Evergetis Monastery. And I, I have placed kind of like on the, in the margins notes so that kind of like when you go back home and you want to review this, you can kind of like uh, go back to the text and actually see the slots and what hymnographical genres are kind of like presented there. And especially with the canon, you can see, uh, like if you see at uh, handout number two, page 56, you can see how detailed the rubrics are as to how, the, how to chant the canon of Cosmas. It's on the right hand side, uh, what would be page 56 in the original. And you can see how I've highlighted where it talks about the canon and then the, the, hymn, the other hymnic elements that continue towards the end of Vespers. Comparing these two, you can see we talk about two very different structures and the amount of ethnography is not even comparable. You can't compare the two because they're so dramatically and drastically different. So my question my central question is, or the hypothesis, if you will, is it was hymnography one of the reasons that made the Studite office so popular? Because you're looking at two fundamentally different structures of the office. It's not like someone can take the cathedral office and insert elements of the, of the so-called monastic or Studite office there. Well. I need to qualify that and say, yes, it can be done, as Simon of Thessaloniki in the 15th century shows. But overall, it's a very different structure. And my question is, why did churches and how did churches in Constantinople gradually shift, or not so gradually, we need to figure that out, from the cathedral office to the monastic office? It, was not a, it wasn't a switch, a moment, no edict came out and says, from now on, everyone use the, uh, the Hagiopolitan office. And I think that era from 800 to 1204 needs to be studied both through the liturgical, hymnographical manuscripts, but also hagiography, which now here can become extremely significant and important to kind of like see whether we have traces of and where we have traces of the use of hagiopolitan elements in the cathedral liturgy. Um, so I think that yes, the, pos the answer is a positive one. Yes, hymnography, I think, was one of the reasons that made the Studite office popular. I don't think it was so much because the monks were the winners of the iconoclasm and hence, you know, their liturgy became the dominant one because they were the, the ones that controlled things. But I think it was uh, hymnography offered the possibility of expression of faith and piety and renewed piety after iconoclasm, something that the cathedral office did not offer the space to do. So it was, as I say here, it was not just the dominance of the victors of iconoclasm, but also about a new popular channel for piety. Uh, a new hymnography and the structures of the studite office that actually could accommodate it. And as Costa notes in his work, and also other authors who deal with uh, the hymnographers, there is a frenzy of hymnographical composition at and uh, right at the end and after iconoclasm. And of course, all that body needs to be fit to fit somewhere. And the place 
is the Studite office, I think. So the canon in this new hymnography, this frenzy of hymnographical composition is, is kind of like central. Um, Costa in his introduction addresses the canon, so I won't get into this. This is not something new, obviously. So the canon is, is, is basically a structure based on the nine biblical canticles. And originally, the hymns of the canon were responses to the verses of the canticles. Um, so you have nine canticles, so you can imagine kind of like the size and the length, if you will, of the canon. Um, so this canon is the most extensive system that allows, as you know, Costa says in his work, allows for an articulated expression of faith and piety in an, extent, in an extensive series of interconnected hymns. So handout number three. Is just one is one example. So you can can have if you're not familiar with the genre of the canon is one example of how the canon works. And I would like to I, I've provided you with a whole canon. This is again on September 14th. So these pages. This is from the current practice, but it's uh, uh, almost identical to what the Studites would do. Um, so look at the Irmos, which is the model stanza, as uh, Costa talked about the Irmos uh, earlier in his presentation. Inscribing the invincible weapon of the cross upon the waters, Moses marked a straight line before him with his staff and divided the Red Sea, opening a path for Israel, who went over dry shod. Then he marked the second line across the waters and united them in one, overwhelming the chariots of Pharaoh. Therefore, let us sing to Christ our God, for he has been glorified. Here you can actually very clearly see the references to Exodus, uh, the, the first canticle. And then the, the, the hymns that follow uh, use that irmos as their, their model, but it makes connection between uh, the, the Exodus text and the Feast of the Cross. For example, in the second one, in times past Moses standing between the two men of God, prefigured in his person the undefiled passion, forming a cross with his outstretched hands, he raised the standard of victory and overthrew the power of all destroying Amalek. Therefore, let us sing to Christ our God, for he is being glorified. And here you see another element that Costa brings up in his work, hymnography as biblical exegesis, uh, in a way that is both theological but also approachable. And then I'll go to the fourth one. Uh, um, and, there, and the fourth one, it continues the theme of the cross, but now no connection to Exodus or implicit. Heaven showed the cross as a sign of victory to Constantine, the holy king and upholder of the faith. Through it, the proud insolence of his enemies was cast down, the seat was overthrown, and the divine faith was spread to the ends of the earth. Therefore, let us sing to Christ our God, for he has been glorified. So this is just the first ode. And again, if you go back home and you want to look at this more, you have the whole canon in your hands, and you can see the connection between the biblical ode and the poetry, but also how this large system of hymns kind of like becomes the core of matins and allows for an expression of faith, teach the faith, doctrine, but also piety. So the canon becomes the hymnographical centerpiece of matins. Um, let us remember again that non-scriptural hymnography was not an organic part of Constantinopolitan daily prayer. You know, in, uh, when we talk, talked about the, the cathedral office, we saw that non-scriptural hymnography is very limited. In the Studite office, it's abundant. And Simon of Thessaloniki, I know this is a little bit anach uh, anachronistic, but Simon is extremely important because he's the last of the Byzantine liturgical commentators. And as the Archbishop of Thessaloniki, he witnessed um, the last breaths, if you will, of the cathedral office in his cathedral, St. Sophia. 
And there, in his works, he admits that while being a huge proponent of the cathedral office and wanting to preserve it, because of the love that people had for the canon, he has to find a way to add hymnography from the, from, from the Hagiopolitan office into his cathedral structures. So uh, at some point he calls the canon, adding the canon to the cathedral structure of Matins as artimatike idisma in the translation of Alex Lingas as sweetening and seasoning. So hymnography is very powerful because it's, and in particular the canons, are seen uh, as a, a place, a context where spiritual exegesis can take place, accessible to the people, uh, which helps in prayer and also in the hymns offer moral teaching and guidance. Um, an example of this frenzy that, that took place right after iconoclasm is uh, Joseph the hymnographer, who wrote 466 canons. More, I mean, uh, if you kind of like divide it by, up by, you know, the 365 days of the year, uh, oftentimes more than one canon per day. Um, and Nancy Shevchenko uh, notes that for dozens of famous saints, for dozens more totally obscure, shadowy figures that had at the time no more identity than a date in the calendar and a name, and for his own friends and contemporaries, for each of these, Joseph composed a canon to be sung at Orthros on the feast day of the saint. And the amount of canons composed is reflected by the fact that many didn't actually made it in, made it into the liturgical books, and that's why many are still waiting to be discovered and edited. So, I referred to this article in the very beginning of, of my, my, my thoughts. In his article, The Early History of the Hagiopolitan Daily Office in Constantinople, Stig Simeon Freushoff asks, how did the Hagiopolitan Daily Office become the predominant daily office in the imperial capital? Our focus will be on what happened, and only a little on why the Hagiopolitan Office expanded in Constantinople and in the era was preferred to the ecclesiastical daily office. That's the cathedral office. The latter questions requires a separate study. I hope that these thoughts today are a contribution to begin answering the why question. Thank you very much.